Hello Year 5 and welcome to your last reading lesson of home learning. So no more photocopying, printing all of those sheets from the book and have a go answering those questions. We're just going to do it all in school on Monday. So this is going to be your last reading lesson that we do via the home learning. So we're going to finish it off by looking at using our inference skills to understand the text. Okay, so as usual, we're going to look at the um, new vocabulary and I'm going to do it in a similar way that I did for our lesson on Tuesday. So when I pull up a specific, a specific tongue tied uh, word that we're going to look at on that page, I'll bring it up alongside it and we'll read through it that way. Okay, we're going to revisit the question stems for inference style questions because it's been a long time since we've actually considered the different types of questions because I've thrown a lot of inference questions into all of your independent writing, okay? So I think it's important for us just to recap what they are so that we know how to identify them. We're then going to have a go at understanding how to answer two and three mark questions. Now, this is something we've not done before, okay? So this is just a little lesson just to see how you get on. So it's not going to be a huge number of activities for you to do for this because it's quite a hard one to get the three marks in and the two marks in. But we're going to give it a go because I'm going to be able to see how you get on and we'll then pick up those skills when we come back to school. So you're then going to have a go answering just a couple of questions based on the text that we read today, okay? So I'm going to start reading the first page on here, okay? And then the next page, there'll probably be a vocabulary one on here. So I think we finished this lesson off where you did your independent task yesterday, where they're about to set off on their journey and Barnabas has given them a pad, um, almost like a parcel, a package with all the things that they're going to need in it. And right at the end of that page, he goes and gives something to Ben. So he hands over what was called a well-thumbed book, okay? So he hands over his book and he says in the book, that everything in the book is good and it describes almost all the fabulous beings ever said to have existed in this world. And it may come in useful on your journey. Oh, thank you, Professor. Ben accepted the book with a shy smile, stroked the cover reverently and began leafing through it. Come on, put it away, Sorrel urged. So reverently means there when you, you take something with gratitude and respect. And so he, said he stroked it respectfully and very solemnly and gracefully and began leafing through it. Come on, put it away, Sorrel urged. We can't stay here while you read a book. See how high the moon has risen already. Yes, okay. Ben took off his backpack and put the map and the professor's book carefully away among his things. Twigleg rose cautiously to his feet behind the tussock of grass the backpacks that was the solution so you remember he'd gone off and he would delivered his message off to Nettlebrand and then he'd come back and decided that he was going to go and hide and he hid behind the bushes hope because they all then came out of the hiding out of the cavern and he thought they were going to be there longer but he needed a plan so that he could stay with them without being found and now he's found the solution Sorrel certainly wouldn't want him going with them however much the boy might but if he simply hid in Ben's packed up, silent as a shadow, the homunculus stole over to it. Now, silent as a shadow, okay, well, we know that shadows don't really have any sounds or anything like that. But a shadow just follows you there and it's very unnoticeable most of the time. So he's just going to be very, very quiet and very well hidden. What was that? asked Sorrel, leaning down from Fidrake's back. Something just shot out of the grass. Oh, there are desert rats here. Diving headfirst in among Ben's clothes, Twigleg disappeared. I have something for you too, Sorrel, said Barnabas Greenbloom, reaching into his basket. My wife gave these to, gave me these to cook with, but I think you'll make much better use of, use of them. He pressed a small bag into Sorrel's paws. She sniffed it curiously. Dried wood, blew it, she cried. Giraules, chanterelles, morals. She stared at Barnabas Greenbloom in amazement. Are you really giving me all these? Of course, the professor smiled. No one appreciates mushrooms better than a brownie, am I right? So those names for those mushrooms, there are loads of different types of mushrooms, and obviously those are ones that people would cook with, so he's kept them and he's always given them to her as a gift. You certainly are. Sorrel sniffs the bag happily once more and then leaps down a fire drake's back to stuff it in her backpack, which was lying on the sand behind Ben's. Twigleg hardly dared to breathe as they strapped the two backpacks together, ready for their journey. But Sorrel was too intoxicated by the fragrance of her mushrooms to notice the mannequin among Ben's clothes. So to be intoxicated means to be over, over consumed by something. So I might say that I uh, was intoxicated by chocolate. So I might literally just have a chocolate overload of me or be intoxicated by sugar, which obviously takes over and controls your whole body. So when you're intoxicated by something, it always takes control. Your whole body is in control of whatever it is. Ben looked all around him. 
Twiglow really does seem to have disappeared, he murmured. Thank goodness for that, said Sorrel, making sure the bag of mushrooms was pushed well down in her backpack, although not before she'd taken one out to nibble. Of course, what else would Sorrel do? All she does is eat. He reeked of bad luck and we reeked his smell. Okay, we looked at this when we did our English unit, so we know that it reeks as to smell of bad luck. Take my word for it. Any brownie would have spotted that at once, but you humans never notice anything. Twiglug would have loved to nip her furry finger so to bite, but he controlled himself and didn't as much as poke the tip of his nose out of his hiding place. Perhaps it was just the fact that he's a homunculus you didn't like, Sorrel, said Professor Greenbloom. Such creatures are seldom popular, so rarely, very not very often, they're, they're not popular, with beings born naturally. In fact, they seem sinister to most people. So a homunculus like Twiglug often feels very lonely and very rejected and clings to whoever made him. Although they do usually live much longer than their makers. Much, much longer. Sorrel shook her head and closed her backpack. One way or another, she said he smelled of bad luck. And that's all there is to it. She's stubborn as a mule, Ben whispered to the professor. I'd noticed, Barnabas Greenwood whispered back. So a mule is a bit like a donkey. And they will stand there all day long. You can poke and prod them and get them to move and carry whatever it is they're carrying. They ain't going to move. So they're stubborn. Okay, very much grounded. Then he went over to Fire Drake and looked into his golden eyes once more. All I have for you is this, he said, holding his open hand out to the dragon. A scale lay on his palm, gleaming, hard and cold, and golden. The dragon bent over it, curious. The professor placed another scale beside it. Now, I'm looking at the word scale and golden. Well, we know that scales must come from a dragon. Now, so far, we've only met one golden dragon. I wonder who you think that the scale might potentially belong to. I found these two scales many, many years ago in the Northern Alps, the professor explained. Cows and sheep had been disappearing there. Hmm. Now, I remember reading part of our text from yesterday's lesson, or possibly even the days before lesson, where Nettlebrand said that he was sick and tired of cows and sheep. And obviously, he'd been eating the cows and sheep. So I'm now starting to think that maybe this story is about Nettlebrand. And the local people told horror stories of a terrible monster prowling down from the mountains at night. So the word here, prowling, okay, this is a verb, two syllables, prowling, it's got the ling, uh, the ing, I-N-G suffix on the end, and it means to move about restlessly and stealthily. So it's almost like if you imagine, if you've ever watched any nature programs, and you've got a lion or a leopard that's in the bushes, and it's very calm, and it sits, and its ears are pricked up, its eyes are still, and it's concentrating, and its hind legs almost come up from like behind him, and you start to see its tail wiggle, and they very, very slowly creep, but they do it in such a smooth one motion after the other, it's almost like being in slow motion. So it means to do something very stealthily, so you can like slink, or you can skulk, or you can sneak. Imagine a bit like a robber, if a robber went into a house, they'd be very sneaky and very stealthy. So it's to do something with great skill, but very quietly and very precisely. Now the opposite of that would be to stay there, okay? So it could be to stay, it could be to hover or linger around, okay? So that's the idea of the prowling there. So it says here, if we go back to it, uh, the people told horror stories of a terrible monster prowling down from the mountains by night. So he'd come down very quietly at night time to go and steal the cows and sheep. Because so obviously if he comes flying over and roaring his fire, the cows and sheep are going to run away. He's got no dinner. Um, at the time, I'm afraid, I could find nothing but these scales, which look remarkably like your own, but entirely different. There are some tracks around too, but they'd been blurred by the rain and the angry farmers who had been milling around. In his hiding place, Twigleg pricked up his ears. Now, why do you think he's pricking up his ears? Mm, okay, so he obviously he works for Nettlebrand. Nettlebrand, his master. So he might know this story. This is a story he's not allowed to repeat, so he might know about this story. So he might not have information that Nettlebrand wants that he can now take back. Um, those scales could only have come from his master. Nettlebrand had lost three scales in the course of his life, and obviously... Um, Barnabas only has two. And in spite of sending all his ravens out in search of them, he had never recovered any of them. He wasn't going to be at all pleased to hear that a human had found two of its precious scales. The mannequin stuck his nose out of Ben's backpack to get a look at them, but the professor's hand was too far above his head for him to see anything. They have no scent, said Fire Drake, as if they were made of nothing. 
yet they feel as cold as ice. May I see them? asked Ben, holding over, bending over the professor's head. Twigleg was listening. You can hold them, said Professor Greenbloom. Look at them closely. They're curious things. Now, the thing that I find weird there is we know that these immaculate creatures, these special creatures, can sense each other from itching or through smells. Now, obviously, there's no scent that's been picked up from these scales. Okay, and this is they're as cold as ice. And obviously, they might potentially be made of something different. There might be something magical or special about them. Ben carefully took one of the scales from the professor's hand and ran a finger over its sharp edges. It did feel like metal, yet there was something else about it too. I believe they're made of false gold, the professor told him, a metal used by alchemists in the Middle Ages when they were trying to make the real thing. Okay, so let's think about that one then. If they're made of gold, they're not real scales, which might explain why Twiglick spends most of his time covering them in the... Um, in the polish, because he's constantly polishing and cleaning them, but that also might explain why Fire Drake hasn't got a scent from them. So they might not even be his real scales. They never succeeded, of course, but this must be alloyed with something else, because that scale is very, very hard. Now I've picked up on the word alloyed here, it's a two-syllable word. Now an alloy, this goes back to one of our science, um, science topics when we looked at our metals, looked at our properties of um, materials. Now an um, an alloy, okay, is something that's made from a mixture of metals, okay? But to alloy something means to mix metals together to make that final substance. So you can mix different materials together to form a new concoction, okay, of metals. So obviously when it says it must be alloyed with something else because it's very, very hard, obviously it looks gold, but gold can be quite malleable. Now we know malleable from science, it can be quite soft to bend if it's heated to the right temperature. But obviously gold will also scratch as well. Now it says it's very, very hard, so it must have been mixed together with something else to make it as hard as it is. So other synonyms that would be to fuse something together or amalgamate. So amalgamate means to put two, two or more things together. And obviously the opposite of that would be divide it or to separate it into the original different types of metals. Now it couldn't, it, I couldn't make the slightest scratch on it, even with a diamond cutter. Now diamond is one of the hardest stones on earth. Okay, so you imagine a cutter that's got to be sharp enough to be able to cut a diamond. It's not been sharp enough to even remotely make a scratch on this gold. Now, you can scratch gold quite easily. So it's definitely been mixed with something else. It's clearly not his real natural scales. Take one with you. You might unravel this mystery too on your travels. I've been carrying those scales around for me for so long that I've given up any hope. Shall I put it in with our things? Ben asked the dragon. Fadrake nodded. Thoughtfully, he raised his head and looked out to sea. Sorrel scurried up onto the dragon's tail. Ben threw her the backpacks and she caught them and slung them over Fire Drake's back. Here we go, she cried. Who knows? Tomorrow morning we might even land where we're meant to, for a change. Well, obviously it's not gone to plan, has it, so far? They've landed in all the yellow patches that they shouldn't have done. The weather is set fair, Sorrel, said the professor, looking up at the sky. So obviously when it's set fair... Looking outside means it's going to be good weather. They're not going to go through a potential thunderstorm again. It looks like it's going to be a fairly easy ride with nice weather. Ben went over to him and shyly offered his hand. Goodbye, Professor, he said. Professor Greenbloom took Ben's hand and pressed it hard. Goodbye, Ben, he said. I really do hope we shall meet again. Oh, yes, he added, handing Ben a small card. I almost forgot this. It's Zabeda's card. If you do visit her after you've stopped off to see the Dijin... Give her my regards. When you give some regards, it means, you know, say hello to them, tell them I say hi and hope they're well. And should you need more provisions or anything else, I'm sure she'll be happy to help you. If the village where she's working hasn't changed too much, then its people will still be waiting, hopefully, for the dragons to return. But you'd better make sure that they know that before Fire Drake just walks in on them. Ben smiled and put the card away with his other treasures. Now, says there... If the village where she's working hasn't changed, then its people will still be waiting, hopefully, for the dragons. Now, what do we know so far about humans' relationship with dragons? Yeah, it's not a good one. It's not a safe one. So this must become some kind of different village, because obviously, had the dragons been there, and they're waiting for them to come back, that tells me they've had a very different relationship to dragons. So maybe we're going to see a change in the relationship between humans and dragons once they find this place. So he smiled to put the card away with his other treasures, then he clambered up on Fire Drake's back. 
Still got my card too, I hope, said Professor Greenbloom. So obviously that's the card he was given to say where his address was. So that's the story so far. We're going to look at some questions now.